And for those of you who I've had the pleasure and honor to maybe be up in front of before, you're going to see a few of the same slides, but I'm going to try to make it not too many. But I have to start with these that I've used uh, before. Um, schools, all of us, I'm not that smart, so I have to simplify everything for myself. We operate on basically three levels. There's the 30,000 foot level of who are we, where are we going, who do we want to be. The 10,000 foot level, what are the systems in place of the school? I've called this the operating system of the school. Other people have used that now. I was the first one to use that. The, what's the operating system of the school? The pedagogy, the curriculum, assessment, evaluation, use of time, use of physical spaces. Those are the systems that comprise our school that need to align to where we're going. And then finally, the ground floor, what are we going to do every day with our students? Schools that are successful and schools that change successfully are strongly aligned amongst these three levels. In the past, and okay, let's just be honest, today, for a lot of you, that's the board and the head's job. That's not my job as a teacher. That's the job of the principals and the division leaders and the deans. That's not my job as a teacher. That's the teacher's job. We don't we, we, we try not to breach these silos. That's crazy. We have to breach these silos in order to find alignment amongst these three levels. So I wanted to, I want to define three terms that I've done before, but I want, we have to resurrect this now for this discussion. Every one of us has a value proposition. 2012, the first time I used the term value proposition in front of 50 heads of school and business officers, I asked them, how many, know, how many of you know your school's value proposition or know the term value proposition? And about 20% raised their hand. I know today every one of you knows that your school has a value proposition. In seven years, we've come a long way. Your value proposition is the difference between what you say you're going to do and what you actually deliver as viewed through the eyes of your customer. Three clauses there, what we say we're going to do, what we actually deliver, as viewed through the eyes of your customer, you can pat yourself all you want on your back that we're doing something. But if your customers don't see it that way, your value proposition is not in increasing. If the more this happens, your value proposition goes up. The more this doesn't happen, your value proposition goes down. That's the first definition, value. The second definition, innovation. The reason I got in my Prius and drove around 10,000 miles around the country seven years ago was to ask a question, what does this term innovation actually mean? I've been having it kicked around a lot. It's not about technology. Innovation is about implementing ideas that add value to the organization over time. In innovation is not about having good ideas. Schools are full of good ideas. Innovation, innovative ideas are ones that will add value to the organization over time. And the third term is about strategy. The third term is strategy. And I need to spend a little bit of time on this. I will say that I want to amplify, let's say, on what uh, Dr. Pearson was, uh, mentioned in her keynote. We as independent schools have gotten strategy desperately wrong in the past. 90, I'm going to say something here that is a bit, maybe a bit over the top. It may not apply to all of you, but I think it will resonate. 90% of 90% of your strategic plans are tactical. They are not strategic. Roger Martin is the, I think, emeritus now dean of the school, of uh, biz school at the uh, University of Toronto. And it's, he has a marvelous book about strategy. I think it's called This Is Strategy. Yeah. Um, where essentially he defines the five questions of true strategy. And in the schools I work with now, I sort of well, I don't work with them if they're not willing to align their strategic, what I call strategic design, not strategic planning, strategic design, along these five questions. Number one, what is our winning aspiration? What is the value proposition that we are going to establish that is going to give us the foundation upon which to excite enough customers to come to our school? Aspiration. We're going to talk about that in a minute. Question number two, what's our market? Where are we actually going to play? What is our demographic, geographic, not just today, but in the future, 10 years from now, 20 years from now, what is our market? Number three, how are we going to win that market? How are we going to entice enough people to come to our school to keep the doors open so that we survive and thrive? Number four, what are those systems 
What are the capabilities? What are the systems that we need to have in place? Like hiring and retaining great faculty. Hiring and retaining great faculty is not a strategy. It's a tactic in order to ensure that you can win your market, continue to win your market. And by the way, hiring and finding great faculty is a meaningless tactic unless you understand and agree with what the term great, what the word great means and have had that discussion. And question number five, how do we know that we're getting any better? Those are the five questions of strategy. And if you go back to your current strategic plan, I can almost guarantee that you can take all of the major and minor headings in your current strategic plan and sort them into one of these five buckets. And now you have a plan that is actually aligned toward your long-term sustainability, which is winning your market enough that you keep your doors open. And so I want to, I, I, this I think is sort of the key uh, diagram that I think is so important that takes us back to that, the three levels of a school, the vision level, the systems level, and the ground floor. Schools have to establish a winning value proposition in this market. It, 20 years ago, your winning value proposition for public schools in America was, the law says you have to go to school, and I'm the nearest one. That was the winning value proposition. 25 years ago, for a lot of you, your winning value proposition was, the public schools aren't so good, and mom and dad went here, and so the kids are going to come to us. It's not probably good enough anymore. Value, that value proposition is what needs to drive strategy. Strategy cannot be agnostic of, because the, the, the qu five questions of strategy speak specifically to your value proposition. And your strategies then need to determine what changes you're going to make in your school. You don't make changes in your school just to make changes. That's the throwing stuff against the wall to see what sticks model. I actually worked in a school that did that for a long time. I'm not going to mention any names. Um, and I was probably complicit in that. But in a, the innovations, the changes need to be directly related to the strategies the school has because, by definition, those changes will add value to back to the school over time. This is not something that a board of non-educator parents whose realistic window of interest in your school is about up to the point where their kid graduates should be responsible for. This needs to be an integrated solution across the silos and across the stakeholders of your school. So we, we know how organizations change. There's a tremendous amount of knowledge base. There are entire libraries that have been written about how organizations change well, both in times of rapid change and not really going back to the Renaissance. Uh, and you don't have time to read all of that. And so we need to distill it down to some tools that you can use in your school uh, to help move forward. I'm not going to go through all of those today. I don't have time. I want to focus on a couple of them uh, uh, only. The first one is this. Um, John Cotter of Harvard is sort of considered the guru of organizational change. And if you haven't read his book, Our Iceberg is Melting, have, how many of you have read that? If you haven't read it, it's a fable about penguins, and it takes about an hour to read. And it's an absolute must read for your leadership team. Uh, you'll get it right away. He has eight state steps of his organizational change model. I've some sort of reduced it down to six. And let me just say this. I believe that whether you're listening to our great, my good friend and great thought leader, Tim Fish, uh, and the work that they're doing in the strategy lab, I've, been par I've partnered with the Canadian Association of Independent Schools on our Strategic Change Accelerator. And by the way, American schools are happy to join the Strategic Change Accelerator. Uh, Ed Leader 21, Transcend Ed, Education Reimagined. Um, uh, time and time again, we, uh, I see real convergence and agreement on the basic steps of organizational change that all are rooted somewhere in Cotter. The, la the, the, the language we use is different, the terms we use are different, but the basic processes and ideas are very similar. Uh, and I just want to emphasize a couple of these steps. Uh, number two is the one I want to talk about most, and it's what I probably spend more time talking in the book about than anything else. Uh, 
in order to not be a school that throws stuff against the wall, that doesn't chase the shiny penny all the time, you have to have some kind of a focal point out there in the future. And I've called it a North Star, others call it other things, a constellation, aiming point, that sort of thing. What is a good North Star? A good North Star is not a vision statement. It's not a mission statement. It's not any group of sentences filled with adjectives and poorly defined adjectives and platitudes. Because everybody has those. Everybody says we're going to be the school that's going to meet the social, emotional, and physical needs of every child and prepare them for college and we're going to have great teachers and all those sorts of Ill -de poorly defined terms. A North Star, here's the best way I can define what a good North Star is. It's a document, a relatively short document that focuses on a handful of things that your school community has said, this is what we believe we are going to be the best at. We're going to be so good that families are going to come to us because we're great at this. And there's enough detail there that you can hand that to a new teacher at your school next year and say to her, if you follow these guidelines and interpret those within your own, from your own background and viewpoint as an educator, you're going to do just fine here. And you're going to help us get closer to our collective North Star. There has to be enough detail in there where we don't just say we're going to raise global citizens. We have to actually say what it means. How are we going to raise global citizens? I'm going to mention here in a moment that I've been working with Porter Goud and uh, DeBose, uh, who many of you know, uh, is in another session. He went to Dr. Pearson's session, which is great. Uh, I'm leaving with him this afternoon to drive up to Porter Goud. I'm going to show you a video about some of the processes we've been going through there. They're going to, they've just had validated what we call their placemat, which is one of the best examples of a North Star that I've ever seen. It, it rose out of their faculty. The faculty said, these are the things, these are the eight things that are, we're really going to focus on. They happen to call it a portrait of a learner, uh, both, both adult and child learner at the school. Uh, and I'm, I'm going to urge them to share it broadly so you can see how simple this is because it gives every member of their community a clear understanding. If you work within these guidelines, in whatever way you interpret that as a teacher, you're going to help us collectively get toward our North Star. It's an academic programmatic North Star, and they'll, I'm sure, share that. So this is an incredibly important step. I'm not, I can't go into, I don't have the time to go into all detail, but I spent a fair bit of time in the book on the actual steps of how you, you can do this. You don't need me. You, you can do this yourself. I want to also just note down here, uh, Mike Cobb, is Mike, he's not in the room. Mike gave the keynote, he gave a workshop. One of the reasons, and uh, one of his uh, division leaders here, uh, Court, uh, Courtney, I'm sorry, no, you're not at that school, you're at the other school. Mike Cobb gave the, uh, Mike w uh, gave the talk uh, uh, the other day, uh, and we asked, what are you doing that allows your school to move so quickly? He was a new head and came in and they just started doing things. And a lot of it had to do with this right here, celebrating these early wins, getting people to say, wow, I want to try something. You say, you know what, do it. And we're going to celebrate that. Because everybody else said, whoa, wow, he's really serious. He's really going to support us in what we're trying to do. And the next group and the next group follow along. So anyway, Cotter is sort of the overarching tool that all of us really are essentially using in order to help our schools change, regardless of some of the language that, that we use. The process, these are the adjectives that I use to describe a process of organizational change that starts with that identification of that North Star and then figures out how we're going to implement it. We, it's a very expansive process. You can't have an aspirational value proposition unless you allow yourselves, unless you require yourselves to be a truly aspirational. We can get to the pragmatism later on. We can get to reality later on. But you have to start out by being aspirational. It has to be transparent to your community so the community sees what's going on. It has to be radically inclusive. The video I'm going to show you here in a minute of the first day we had at Porter Gout of doing this, we had 300 people in the gym. 60 students, all the faculty, all the administrators, most of the trustees, 
There were alums there. There were non-trustee parents, all in one gymnasium together. It's radically inclusive. It, work, it looks at the system level of the school. Uh, it is ongoing. It doesn't start and stop one time every five years. That's just not how the world works any longer. And you know what? It's a little bit messy. It's a lot messier than asking a committee to get together and essentially define your strategic plan and everybody else goes, yep, okay, it's over there on that shelf somewhere, but I really don't know how I'm supposed to uh, contribute to that or deal with it. This is a short video that, uh, and I, I'm not showing you this because I'm in it, thank God I'm not in it for very much, um, of this day. This is what I think good strategic, how good strategic design starts and looks uh, at a school. Education and the way that I was educated growing up has changed so much and the ability to really look into the future and prepare my kids for a very different world. We brought a large number of stakeholders together, particularly the faculty who are going to be responsible for delivering value in the future and the students who are so important in understanding what that value is. I think it's great to just be a student and be able to get your voice heard. Like my group has been wonderful and they want to know what we really think. And it's not like the students are here just because you have to have students present. They really want us here and I think that's really cool. The process has really impressed me because of how inclusive it is. I think in order for us to be able to maximize this a strategic planning opportunity and exercise, we really need to have input not only from the students, from the faculty, from parents, alum. It gives us a, a collective product that I think is, um, is just so important. The idea of being able to spend a little time envisioning what Port of Out's future could be like is, is incredible to be um, a part of that. People were really just being creative with their ideas and feeling free to think outside the box. I feel like I should as a student, present this to other students so they can get an idea and get the inspiration that we're getting and get the ideas that, hey, we can change, like we can make changes. Schools are human-centered organizations. Kids aren't cookie cutters, and yet we've built them into that sort of model. It was really awesome to sit on the same side of the table as these parents and brainstorm together. It gave me great insight um, in a relaxed setting of what these parents want. And to hear that as a director was really, really powerful. So often we as faculty talk about things we think we're doing or we should do, and then to hear some of the students validate that uh, is great. But then also to hear the students kind of come up with new ideas that we can then use going forward in our classrooms and also with this larger strategic plan. What we envision for October is really interactive sessions, focus groups, so that parents can talk more about what their hopes and dreams are. The idea of a partnership that we're all in this together as a community is very, very important. Some of us spend 12 years of our lives in the Porter Gout community, and to be able to have some say or input in how we can shape what this community could be like is, is just tremendous.